Sorry, yeah, yeah. I might have one on yet. Give me a moment. See, you're very unattractive when you're putting this on by reaching out around my back. Then I gotta get these in my ears. There we go. Hi. Well, how are you all doing today? Good morning, Lord Mulberry. Well, good, good evening to you. You're in the UK. And, uh, Mokhtaba. Mokhtaba. Good to see you here. I'll have to admit, <clears throat> I'm not feeling 100% today. I feel like I'm coming down with something. Although it's been very slow to come on. Usually, <clears throat> these things kind of hit me all at once. Like I get a sore throat and then the next day I'm congested. And yesterday it was kind of like, oh, I can't tell if it's allergies or if it's cold. So I've taken some allergy medicine. We'll see if that knocks it down. Plus, it is actually cold today. It's supposed to rain later today. Well, uh, so this is week 15 of the semester. And what does that mean? Well, it means we're just about done the whole semester. And I had also planned on having a, uh, a worksheet for you to practice these Thompson's constructions and transforming NFAs into DFAs and so forth. And I just didn't get to it this weekend. It was Mother's Day this weekend here in the United States. So I was kind of busy with uh, all that stuff. Um, so I, I, my inclination is like, A, I'm not feeling 100% and B, um, didn't get to it, that we might just uh, say, well, it was a good idea at the time and instead focus on wrapping up everything for this semester. So those of you who are in my class, here's what you need to do this week and next week. Uh, first, finish up your assignments. If you haven't gotten them finished up, now would be a time to do it. Uh, second, uh, and I haven't yet set this up, but uh, I'll, I'll make an announcement when it is ready is you'll go on to Canvas, our class website, scroll all the way to the bottom, and there will be a couple of things for you to do there. One is to fill out an end of the semester reflection survey. So that's where you tell me a little bit about how the semester went, what you learned from the class, how you think it went, and what grade you think that you earned uh, by the end of the semester. And then secondly is to sign up for a time slot to have a meeting with me next week. It'll be about a five minute meeting, so very quick. Um, I haven't yet got those time slots set up, but when I do, I'll have an announcement out. And then you'll just go and sign up for a time slot. Um, the time slot will have a dedicated Zoom ID for it, but I don't want you to use that. I want you just to use that for the scheduling purposes. The actual Zoom ID will be the one to use, let me turn off the music here, um, will be the one to use for my office hours. So the reason for that is I have to meet with about a hundred of you and it's easier for me to just sit in one Zoom session the entire uh, time that I'm on rather than switching Zoom sessions every 10 minutes. So although it will assign a Zoom ID to you, don't use that one. Use the one just for my office hours. Um, and then, so that'll be next week and I'll have time slots available, I think pretty much, you know, Monday through Friday. I'll, I'll try to focus more on earlier in the week because I know there are some of you who just want to get this done and out of the way. It's nothing scary, right? I'm not going to, you know, browbeat you or anything. It's just going to, we're just going to come in, we're going to meet, ask how the semester went, looked at all the work that you did over the semester and then uh, reach a consensus, consensus on uh, what grade uh, you'll be receiving. So make sure you get all of your work done this week so that you can come into those uh, Zoom meetings, or that the one Zoom meeting, all ready to go. Um, I guess uh, before we, I think that's all we got to do. I mean, as far as procedural stuff. Um, so those of you who are on my Zoom session, do you have any questions?
No? Good. Oh, one question, Professor. Yes. So uh, for the uh, assignments, uh, is it necessary to uh, do all the uh, deep dive assignments as well, or they are extra credits? Well, there's, remember, we're using ungrading here, so there's no extra credit. Um, and then nothing is required. You don't have to do assignments, so it's really up to you. The more you do, then, you know, the essentially the, the, the more likely we are to reach a higher grade. So I would do them, but, you know, because there are no grades assigned to anything, you don't have to do anything, but it all counts towards your portfolio of work. Does that make sense? Right. It's kind of confusing, yes. right? It's a new yes. way of thinking about things, right? Nothing's required. You don't have to do anything, but the less you do, the, the, the lower your grade will be. Professor, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are we allowed to record on our own devices, like hard drives, your lectures? Because they're so awesome. Like, I would love to keep it for my reference, like down the road later on. Oh, yeah. Life. So on Zoom, you can download the videos. There's a, a, there's a link you can click on to download the videos. And also, they're all posted on YouTube. So uh, you, can, you can watch them over there, too. So, but yeah. OK, thank you. Anything else? So I posted on uh, the subject of today was like 8-bit retro day because I had kind of like nothing else to do, uh, nothing else planned. And, and so I, I've been kind of promising this for the semester and some of the people on YouTube have been looking forward to this. And that was to give you a, just a brief idea about what it was like to program, you know, the computers that I used when I was back in elementary, grade school, high school, and so forth. So, I mean, this goes way back. Let me go and uh, reach for one of these computers out of my closet. I'll be back in just like 30 seconds. Hopefully I won't knock over too much stuff on the way. Okay, I don't remember if I brought one of these out at the beginning of the semester, um, but uh, this is an Apple IIe computer. <clears throat> this dates back to about 1982, 1983, so we're looking at 40 years ago. And at the time, this computer, I, th I think just this unit would have been about $2,000. And, and this is not it, right? So this is not a, I mean, it is a complete computer, but it's not entirely useful because there's no way to store any files on it. There's no monitor, there's no printer. So those would all be extra. <laughs> and so if you wanted to maybe make a complete working system, you probably got, um, and I'll show you in a second, two disk drives, two floppy disk drives. Each one of those was about $400. So we're looking at adding $800 to the price. Um, and then a monitor would have been, and, and it would have been kind of like a black and white, or back then a green and black monitor. Or you could get a color monitor, that was more expensive. So a, a monochrome monitor would have probably been about uh, $200. If you want a color one, maybe add $400. And then a printer was also probably about three or $400. So we're probably looking at, when it's all added up, probably close to $4,000 to spend on a computer. And um, in today's money, that would probably be, uh, let's see, 4000 probably close to $9,000. So imagine you're a family and you want to buy a computer and you got to dish out the equivalent of, of almost $10,000 for a computer for your family. And um, looking back, I can see you know, what a sacrifice my parents made to be able to buy something like this for our family. Um, so, this, so what this computer has is obviously has a keyboard, and it's got some connectors on the back for connecting up. Uh, where, the monitor would connect right here, so it's not a standard VGA or HDMI. This is what's called a composite monitor, kind of like if you look on old DVD players, there's usually one of these jacks on the back just for connecting up an old-style television. And then we got two jacks here for connecting up a cassette deck, right? If you 
didn't have disk drives, you were going to save and load your programs to audio cassette tape, and you would hook that up here. And then this was for connecting up your joystick or your, your game controls. Um, in, this is actually mostly air. It's actually fairly light. So let me, the opening it up was as easy as just uh, pulling the lid off. And then this is what the inside of the computer looked like. So what do we got here? Uh, right, can you see that right there? That is the microprocessor. This is a 6502 8-bit processor capable of addressing up to 64 kilobytes of memory. Not megabytes, not gigabytes, kilobytes of memory. And then you had, um, uh, uh, what else is important here? D down here is, can you see, whoops, down here. This is the, this is the first uh, 64 kilobytes of memory right down here. So these are eight memory chips. Each one of them holds eight kilobits. Um, but usually that wasn't enough. So although the microprocessor can address up to 64 kilobytes of memory, it was typical to also buy a memory expansion board. Now this is a modern one. There are actually hobbyists and enthusiasts producing modern uh, expansion cards that you can put into the computer. And so this is one that, believe it or not, holds a whopping eight megabytes of memory. Um, and it also adds the ability to display more text on the screen. Without this card in here, we can only display what's called a 40 column display. It can display text that had 40 columns across and 24 columns down. And then this added the ability to display up to 80 columns across and 24 down. Um, so an expansion card like that, that held an additional 64 kilobytes of memory would have cost, again, two or three hundred dollars. And nowadays you can buy one of these cards for about twenty dollars. And remember, those are there's an, and that was two or three hundred dollars for things that were built in quantity in bulk at the time. And now this is a card that's being built by just a hobbyist. Twenty dollars. Um, and what else do we have in here? Uh, we have the disk drive controller card. So uh, when we hook up a disk drive to it, this, uh, the disk drive will connect to the connector on the back. We've also got a serial card for hooking up a modem, and then finally a printer card for attaching a printer. So that would have been uh, a typical outfitting for a computer at the time. So let's, uh, let's set this aside and now, I don't, I don't have that computer hooked up. It's kind of bulky, and to set up the whole thing, um, you know, it gives you that old 8-bit experience, and I can look at it and go, wow, that's what my computer looked like back in the 1980s. But these days, what you would do is probably use an emulator. You can run a complete emulator in your browser or on your computer that emulates all of that hardware, but entirely in software. But before we do that, let me show you one of those disk drives. So again, I got to reach back into my boxes here. I have one that's already uh, ready to go to, open, to show you. There it is. So this is one of those disk drives. This is a five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive. And I have the lid removed on this so we can look inside. So again, one of these things would have been about $400, four to $500 back then. And uh, but they're actually fairly simple. It's got a, a controller board inside and all this does is it converts the magnetic uh, field of the uh, disk drive into the ones and zeros, or the floppy disk that gets to the ones and zeros, they get sent down this cable to the, uh, the computer that's plugged into. But uh, let me get a floppy disk. I've got one sitting out here that I can use. There we go. Let me just grab one. Anyone will do. Here we go. Some of you may actually recognize the title on this. The Oregon Trail. So 
So if you wanted to uh, use this game, you would uh, put the disk drive, the floppy disk, into the slot in front, and then close this door. And what the closing this door does, it, now it's kind of hard to see because everything's kind of cramped in there, but it, can you see that? It raises and lowers this lever, and on top of this, or is it on top? No, it's on the bottom. Uh, all it does is it, is it lowers this lever, and that causes that white thing there to clamp down on that central hub in the floppy disk, and then that enables it to be turned. And then way in the back, which you can't see, but it's back in there, is the read-write head, and it's on, actually on the bottom of the of the floppy disk. So all the reading writing happens on the bottom side of it. So this is a floppy disk drive, not a uh, floppy disk, not unlike the the ones you've probably seen. You know, these standard three and a half inch ones. Just the three and a half inch floppy disks are called floppy, not because of the outer casing, but because of what's on the inside. If you were to slide the shutter open, you can see the floppy media inside and it's a flexible magnetic plastic material. And it's basically the same thing that's inside one of these. You can see that material through this little uh, opening right here. So the advantage of these little ones here was this shutter door prevents you from putting your fingerprints all over the magnetic media. Whereas these, they are open for you to put your fingerprints on. So there was, these always came with warnings, you know, like on the back of the envelope. It says like, you know, don't touch the media there. Don't expose it to magnetic fields. Uh, don't bend this thing. Don't tear it. Just, and leave it in its envelope when you're not using it. Um, let's see. A comment here says, um, Mother gave you a Commodore 64 back in 1987. Spent a lot of hours by the week, mostly because it came without a floppy disk. Yeah, I, um, I have one of those. I, 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 I have one. I have not actually turned it on. I, so I bought it like two years ago, and it's just been sitting on a shelf. Here's your, here's your Commodore 64. This, uh, so this computer came out probably about four years, I'm guessing four or five years after the Apple II came out. So it had the benefit of a couple of years of extra development before it came out. So the graphics on the Commodore 64 are better than they are on the Apple II. Um, Still limited to 64 kilobytes of memory, and that's what the 64 represents. And this one didn't have expansion slots inside, but instead there were a selection of ports on the back that you could use to plug things in. So monitor goes there. Um, one of these is for the, I think this one or this one is for the disk drive. And then you got some expansion ports that you can use. So the Commodore 64 was also a very popular computer at the time. Some of my friends had one. I didn't have one. I had the Apple IIe, so I'm not as familiar with the Commodore 64. However, the first, the very first computer I ever programmed was in fourth grade, about 1980, um, 1980, and that was the Commodore PET, the predecessor to this one. Um, some interesting things that Commodore... Uh, decisions, uh, te technical decisions they made versus the Apple decisions was the um, the folks at Apple, you know, like Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, th uh, they made the decision that they wanted to make the hardware as cheap and as effective as possible. So the controller boards on these disk drives are actually very simple. The computer sends the signals down this cable to do things like turn the motor on and off and move the, the heads back and forth inside the disk drive. All of that happens inside the computer on that controller card, and a lot of that happens in software. So the software will calculate what track the head is on now and what track it needs to go to, and then send the signals down to the disk drive to move the head 
So if it needs to move from track, let's say, 10 to track 15, it'll send five pulses to, to move the head um, ahead by five tracks. And so that enabled the hardware to be fairly simple and most of the work to be done in software. Um, I think that had one really good trade-off and that was by making the hardware simpler and putting most of that work in the software, you could actually make improvements to the efficiency and the speed of these disk drives as time went on. And in fact, that's what happened. In the first version of the operating system for the Apple was called DOS, D-O-S, Disk Operating System. Not to be confused with the one for Windows, it's a different <laughs> disk operating system. Um, but then in the mid-1980s, they came out with one called ProDOS, and since all of the disk operations were handled in software, ProDOS actually was more efficient at using these disk drives. It was a bit faster and quieter. They actually were able to make it quieter by sending the signals at a different rate and make the, the clicking noises not quite as loud. So that was an interesting thing that they could do. Uh, versus what Commodore did, Commodore decided, uh, <clears throat> this was the disk drive for, for a Commodore 64. And, uh, you know, it has, has a five and a quarter inch mechanism. It's just a, it's just a, a shorter one because it was a little bit newer. So they could shrink this down a little bit. But inside the Commodore 64, in the back end over here, not only is a complete power supply, because you plug this into the wall with its own power supply, but it's also, there's also a complete working computer inside of here with the same processor that's in the Commodore 64 unit itself. So what would happen there is when you wanted to use the disk drive, the Commodore 64 main unit would just send a command to here to say, to basically program the disk drive about what to do. You know, move to track 15, read the data off there, and then feed it back to the main unit. And also, the data would come out not in parallel, but in serial. So it was a bit slower to get the data off the disk drives as opposed to off the Apple, which come, the data comes in parallel. So the disk drives on the Commodore 64 were slower, much, much heavier, because they contain a power supply and a, a complete working computer in there. And um, they also uh, were slower because they use a serial interface versus a parallel interface. So that was a trade-off that Commodore made, was we're going to make the computer a bit simpler and we're going to make the software on the computer a bit simpler and move a lot of that processing power into the disk drive itself. I don't remember how much these things cost, but I imagine they were more expensive than disk drives for the, um, the Apple because, you know, there's a whole computer in here. And uh, there's a video on YouTube that actually demonstrates there's a complete computer in here because the, the person who made that video basically wrote a program on the Commodore 64 to send a program to this one and then unplugs the Commodore 64 main unit, and this thing here just continues doing its work, right? So even though it's been completely disconnected from the main unit, it's still able to move the heads back and forth and read and write data. And that shows you there's a complete computer in here. Um, and also, because these things were so expensive, it was typical for a Commodore 64 user to have only one of these, and an Apple II user would have two disk drives. You didn't know that was sitting up there this entire time. You just can't see it off the screen. Um, Lord Nobury says you used to have your ZX Spectrum. I that was actually one of the computers I really wanted to have was a ZX Spectrum. I had a uh, well, I guess you would call it a ZX Spectrum. I had a ZX81. That was my very first computer. It was a whopping hundred dollars. I saved up a long time. This was back in fourth or fifth grade. I saved up a long time for that little computer. I had one kilobyte of memory. <laughs> it was like the cheapest, cheapest little thing you'd possibly buy. But for somebody for, uh, you know, at my age, it was like, wow, this is like a great little computer. Plug it into television and away you go. Um, but the ZX Spectrum was the one I really wanted. That had, what, a 48 kilobytes of memory and color. And it was faster. It had sound, right? But uh, I could never afford one of those. Plus, they, didn't, they were never sold in the United States. So that was another bummer. Uh, 
Um, so, so that was that was basically the kinds of computers I had back then. So we had the Apple II. I had the Apple II. A lot of my friends had the Commodore 64. And uh, some of my other friends had an, an Atari 400 and Atari 800. Same idea, 8-bit computer, very limited expansion, very limited memory. You hook it up to a television in order to get... And, and by, of course, televisions back then weren't these giant monstrosities that we have now. A typical television would have been 13 or 15 inches diagonally, so it could fit nicely on top of the computer or next to the computer or just on your desk. I have to keep in mind that, that your experience with some of the terms that I'm using are probably a vastly different that, than the terms, the same terms that I would have used back in the 80s and 90s. So things like television, you think of a 32 inch, 57 inch thing, and I think of a little 13 or 15 inch thing. Um, okay, so if you wanted to use one of these computers, then you would, you could actually just turn the computer on and it would be useful. And, and I said about five or ten minutes ago that these days it's a lot easier to just use an emulator on your computer rather than getting the actual hardware. And the, the computers were so simple that they can be emulated entirely in your web browser. And uh, so I have two emulators on my computer. One is a web browser emulator and one is a actual virtual, virtual machine emulator, so it runs as a separate application. I'm going to show you the web browser one first, because that's one that any one of you can get access to. So here's the, here's the address for it. See if I can zoom in here. It's uh, www.skullandsteel.com slash Apple, you don't need this pounce on in the end. Uh, Apple slash slash E. So that's Apple 2. There's the 2 right there, and there's the E. So if you just uh, load that page up, and you come across a page that looks like this. So obviously up here is the, is the screen, and then down here is a kind of a virtual keyboard but you can use your regular keyboard. The, the only thing this keyboard has that you may not recognize, otherwise it looks like a, no, a pretty normal keyboard, is it's got these two keys here. This one here is called Open Apple, and this one is called Closed or Solid Apple. You can kind of think of these as being similar to the Windows keys that you find now on keyboards. Also things like the tilde and the back tick are kind of in a different spot, but you know you get used, used used to that. It's also got a button here in the top right called reset, and your your PC probably also has a reset button. But these days this is a it's a soft reset, and um, this reset here is called a hard reset. When you press reset, it's actually going to you know do something. Okay, so you turn this thing on, and by turn it on, meaning like you load the web page. And it, what would have happened was the computer would have uh, beeped, and then you've got now one of the disk drives, its light has turned on because now it's looking for a disk to boot from. But we don't have one just yet, so what you're going to do is you're just going to click on Reset. <laughs> There's an 8-bit beep there. And then you've got this prompt. I'm going to zoom in now. Here we go. And this is the basic programming prompt. You can now start typing in a program in BASIC. Now, if you want to save the program, uh, your, your, your options are very, very limited because we haven't loaded the operating system, but you can at least start typing something in. So programming in BASIC is actually a lot like programming in Python in that you can just type in a basic statement and it will execute it right there on the spot. Or you can type in a program and then run the program later on. So let's go ahead and type in something. Now the first thing you probably would do if you're doing any programming language is type in like a hello world program. So that's as easy as typing in 
print quotes, hello, ending quotes, and then it does it. Uh, oh, by the way, my caps lock key, my virtual caps lock key is on, so I'm going to click that to turn it off. These op, op, uh, modifier keys like caps lock and shift and control on this virtual keyboard are sticky so that you can press multiple keys at once. So I'm going to turn off the caps lock just because I'm more used to seeing things in lowercase. And, um, okay, so things about programming in BASIC. Normally, you type in one statement per line, and when you press enter, it executes the line. If you want to type in more than one thing to do on a single line, you separate the statements by colons. Okay, not semicolons like you might be used to, but colons. So I could do something like for, if I want to do a loop, for i equals 1 to 10, right? So we've got this old school loop style, not this for x equals 1, x is less than 10, x plus plus. You just say for x, for i equals 1 to 10, colon, let's print. Oh, by the way, if you want to delete, um, you don't press the delete key. You press the, the, the left arrow key. So you can use the left and right arrow key. Not delete. And I'll explain why in a moment. Print, hello colon, next. So this loops from 1 to 10, prints out hello, and then loops back. So this is the beginning of the loop, and this is the, the end of the loop over here. Now, if you want to print something out so that it doesn't go to the next line afterwards, then use a semicolon on the end, which tells print. This is, this is just special for print. It tells print not to go to the next line after each print. Uh, you know, we can also do for i equals 1 to 20. Uh, print i, semicolon. Actually, let's, let's, let's not do the semicolon. There we go. So very easy to do a quick little loop in BASIC. So let's actually program the computer so that it doesn't just execute the statements right there on the spot. The way you program this is there's no editor, for one thing. That, that's, that's what's completely different about this. There's no editor. There's no way to just like uh, bring up a user interface and start scrolling around. What you do is you type in each line, but you precede each line with what's called a line number. And uh, the line numbers are just going to be used to order the statements within your program. It's typical to start your line numbering at 10 rather than 1 or 0. So let's go uh, 10, print, hello, and then that has now put in a line into our program. We can see the, the program itself by typing list. And then if we run the program by typing R-U-N, we you know, get the output. Now, if we wanted to do something else, then we uh, put in a new line number. Let's say we wanted to do line 20, print. Um, this is an apple. And if we type list, we can now see that the statements have been ordered 10 first and then 20. It just puts them in numeric order. And then run. Hello, this is an apple. Good. If you want to change what it prints out, if I want to change what line 10 does, I really have no choice but to just type line 10 over again. 10, print, hello, comma. And let's say I want this to continue on the same line. And now when I list the program out, it has replaced line 10 with the new one that I typed in. So there really is no way 
at least no easy way to uh, just edit a line and cha easily change what it does. You have to type that line over again. Kind of crazy, huh? But that, that's what it was like back then. And for the reason for that is there's just not a lot of memory in the computer to do things like have a complicated editor or, um, you know, nice user interface. It was designed so that you could type in a program fairly easily. And if you wanted to uh, get a program from someone else, you went and got a book or a magazine and you typed in that program line by line by reading each line off the page in the magazine or book and typing it in yourself. <clears throat> so let's go like 30 for i equals 1 to 10, uh, 40, print i, 50 next. Here's our complete listing. So your loops don't have to be all in one line. They can be on multiple lines. That's not a problem. Okay, let's see what we can do with this. Um, so in addition to printing out I, how about this, 40? I'm going to say H tab I. Now, I want to put in something between 40 and 50. What I want to do is I want it to print out I itself. I, actually, I want it to print out a star. So I'm going to go 45, print a star. And you can see, by giving this number 45, it puts it in between 40 and 50. That's why you typically start your line numbers at 10 and you go up by 10s. So that if there's uh, something new that you want to do and add it to your program, you just pick a line number that goes in between the existing lines. And then if I wanted to put in something between 40 and 45, I'd pick something like 42 or 43, kind of like doing a little binary search. Um, and then, of course, if, if, you have a, if you've run out of line numbers, like you, you've got now something between 40 and 41 and 42, 43, 44, and 45, and you want now you want to put something in between 41 and 42, there's no 41.5. Now you've got to do be creative like use the colons to separate multiple statements and put multiple statements on one line. But let's see what this program does. Oh, nice. Prints those stars in a line. So the H tab here means horizontal tab. We're going to horizontally tab over by I characters, by I spaces, and then put our star. Um, I want to get rid of lines 10 and 20. So I'm just going to type 10 and then 20. Those got rid of those. And let's change this loop to go for i equals 1 to, uh, let's do, oh, heck, let's do, let's do, let's do 39. Okay. So now we got stars to go all the way across. And then let's, let's come back the other way. So let's go maybe 60 for i equals uh, 38 to 0. Step negative 1, because I, I want it to go backwards. H tab I. Uh -huh. Whoops, I forgot to put a line number in there. 70, H tab I. 80, print a star. And then 90, next. Hmm. And one extra star over there. Where'd that come from? Ding. That's interesting. I wonder if it's something to do with H tabbing zero. Does H tab zero do oh H tab zero does that. So I don't want this actually to be zero. I want that to be a one. So I need to type that line over again. For I equals 38 to 1, step negative 1. There we go. That's what I wanted. And now, if I just wanted to do that over and over and over again, um, here's where things get a little interesting. Modern programming practice would be, let's wrap that whole thing up inside of some kind of loop that makes this go over and over again, like an infinite loop. But in BASIC, you have 
this statement called go to. And this was actually your primary like flow of control statement. So although you do have if and for, uh, that's, that's basically it. You have if, you don't have else, by the way. You have if, <laughs> and you have uh, for, and that's your, your condition and your loop. So if I want to make this go over and over and over again, what I'll do is maybe at line 100, I'll just say, go back to line 30. So once it gets down here to line 100, it's just going to go back and start the program over again. And then if I, if I want to stop it, uh, I either have to press reset or I can press control C. I'm going to do control C. Oh, no. I don't know where that came from. All right, so contr control C, which some of you might recognize as the, you know, the character suppress if you want to cancel or stop a job on a command line system, like uh, Linux or Unix. It's the same on the Apple, control C. That's I wonder if that's where they got it. Oh, uh, let's see. What else could we do? Oh, the Apple II had some rudimentary graphics. Uh, if you type in GR put in the graphics mode, and then you can say, like, pl uh, plot uh, 5, 5. Is that it? I don't quite remember how to do this. Oh, I, have to, I think I just say color uh, 3. Nope. Uh, what was it? Now I don't remember. What, what is the command for setting the color? been a while since I've done this programming. I'm looking it up. Oh, huh. it's easier. Color equals. There it is. So you got a bit, um, I think in this mode you had 16 colors that you can choose from. Oh, why did we get all the at signs there? That is because the text screen and the graphic screen occupy the same spot in memory. So when you go into graphics mode, all you're really doing is you're putting text on the screen and it shows up as blocks of, of color on the screen. So let's, let's add like line 10, let's go into graphics mode. And let's say at line 200, let's go back to, oh, we'll just leave it like that. And then instead of printing a star, we'll say 45 plot. Um, I comma, uh, well, let's do this. We'll go 20, whoops, 20 color equals yeah, two. Okay, 40. We'll say plot i comma i. And we'll take out line 45. Okay, and then 70 will do the same thing. Plot i comma i. And then take out line 80. We'll see what's going to happen. Oh, and then we're just looping over and over again, so. Let's see, let's go back to text mode. Let's, um, let's take out line 220. What I'm, what I'm thinking is, how can we get it to maybe do, uh, cycle through some colors? So let's go, um, well, let's try this. Let's go line 35, color equals color plus one. This is how you increment something. And then line 36, we'll say if 
color is equal to, if it went too high, if color equals 16, uh, then color equals 0. Okay. And then, uh, let's see what happens. Oh, I'm going to take out line 100 because I don't want to do that over and over again. All right, so here we go. Uh-oh, syntax error. What happened? I guess I cannot check to see what color it currently is. So what I'll have to do, ooh. Okay, this is also a problem right here. You see this? So the way basic is handled in, and this is common for all basics, not just Apple basic. Um, the what it does is when you type in a statement, it quickly goes to that statement and looks for any keywords like print, and, or, not, if, for, plot, um, read, write, things like that. And it turns, and it quickly turns those into tokens. So it tokenizes your program. All it does is it looks for the keywords and it turns those into one byte codes. This is a way to compress the program a little bit. So it went through my, my statement here and it found the or in color and it said, oh, that's a keyword. I'm going to turn that into the or keyword, not part of this variable name. And so that's actually creating a problem here. <laughs> um, and apparently I can't treat color like a variable and check to see what its value currently is. Also, color equals is a keyword. Color equals, not color, a variable name, but color equals is a keyword. So what I have to do here is I have to have a separate variable that keeps track of the current color. Now, here's a little bit about variables in, in most basics is they're limited to one or two characters, right? That's it. You get one or two characters. So you can have a variable called like X or I. Uh, you can have a variable called like AB, but that's it. You can't have a variable called color. This is not actually a variable. This is a, a keyword. If you type in a variable that's longer than two characters long, it will just ignore everything after the second character. So essentially, your, your, although you can type in variable names that are longer than two characters, it only looks at the first two. So here's what we're going to have to do. Is we're going to have to make a separate variable. Let's call it C. So maybe uh, line 20, C equals zero. Okay, and then... Um, Let's say line 32, actually I'll do it on, the, on line 35, we'll go for, nah, 32, uh, C equals C plus 1, okay, and then maybe 35, if C is equal to 16, then C is equal to 0, so we're going to cause it to loop back, and then on line 36, we'll say color equals C. All right, so we've got a separate variable called C that's keeping track of the color. We're going to increment it. If it's equal to 16, set it back to 0, and then assign that to be the color, and then plot that box. There we go. Oh, so it, it got overwritten because of the, the other loop that's running. But did you see it? Let's go back and look at it again. I'm going to get rid of line 60 and 70, and 90. There we go. You can see these flashing characters are caused by the graphics now switching over into text mode and them occupying the same bytes in memory. Okay, so you got the basics of how to write a program in BASIC. You type in a line number, and it inserts that line into the program at the appropriate spot. And if you type in an existing line number, it overwrites that line with a new line, with the, with the line that you just replaced it with. But there's no way for me to save this program. In order to be able to do that, I need to boot the computer up with some kind of operating system that knows how to use the floppy disk drives. And in this emulator, we can go ahead and load up, let's see, one of the system disks. So what I did there is I clicked on this little open folder, and then I clicked on system. There's all sorts of games in here, too. 
interactive fiction, music. Right, but we'll go with system here. Prodos 8. Open. And now I want to boot the computer. So to boot it, I go open Apple, control, and reset. So you've got to hold down all three keys. Very similar to the old Windows, like, uh, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, Alt, control, delete, right? And then let's, uh, let's exit to basic here. So I just use a down arrow key. Using the upper and down arrow keys, or you can just hit the hit the number, and then press enter or return. So now we've got a disk operating system loaded. We can type in a command like cat and get a catalog of what's on that disk. Oh, there's not much in the way of uh, free space here. I'm going to have to free up some space here. I don't need some of these things. Let's just let's just go delete uh, util.0. Gosh, I hope I don't. This will be fine. And remember, we're not we're not deleting it for everyone who uses this emulator. We're just deleting it for us. Okay, now we got some free space. Oh, uh, let's see, what can we do? Let's write a program that um, I mean, I wanted to like do something semi-useful that someone at a, with a you know college education would uh, would I mean obviously you use these computers to play games and write some simple programs, but if you want to do word processing or surfing the web, of course you use your modern computer. But what, how can I how can I loop this into stuff that we've learned this semester? Let's let's do this. Let's let's write a program that uh, fills an array with some random numbers and then sorts it. How about that? So we got a, got nothing there. So let's first we need to fill uh, an array. First thing to do is tell it that we want to make a variable who is an array. Now arrays in basic are 10 elements long by default, but we'll want to make it a little bit longer. So we'll say dim, and those of you who know Visual Basic, probably recognize this. Um, dimension, let's do, let's call it A, and let's make it, I don't know, 100. And then we'll go for I equals, now the arrays here, what I've done here is, now this is a little bit interesting, by dimensioning it to 100, I've actually told it what the highest index number is. So the array is numbered 0 through 100. It hasn't set aside 100 elements. It's actually set aside 101 elements. And the highest index number is 100. I think the people that, that, did, that invented BASIC did that so that you could choose whether you wanted your array to be indexed from starting at 0 or indexed starting at 1. You'd always, if you started at 0, you get a little bonus element. You get 101 elements. If you start your indexing at one, then you get 100 elements like you expect. So let's go for i equals uh, zero to, uh, yeah, 99. Now, uh, see, how do we pick a random number? Let's see, can we just go, I think we do, we do rand, is it zero? Random zero? Nope. RND zero? <sighs> no, I don't remember. I gotta look it up. I'm looking at my my uh, quick reference of basic commands.
Oh my gosh, where is it? Oh, it should be R&D. Oh, I, that's because I got to say like print R&D. There we go. So um, the random number generator, if you pass in zero, it gives you the, the random number, the previous random number. And if you pass in anything other than zero, it generates a new random number. And the number you pass in can be anything other than zero. So the number you actually pass in doesn't matter as long as it's not zero. And it gives you a random number between zero and one. So I need to scale that up if I want to generate a number between, let's say, um, 1 and 100. I could say print random 1 times 100, and now that'll give me a, a number between 0 and 99. And if I just want an integer, I can say print integer of random 1 times 100. That gives me a nice integer. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to use. So we'll go 30 uh, a sub i equals int random 1 times 100. And then 40 next. And that should fill my array now with 100 random numbers. Then let's print it out. So 50 for i equals 0 to 99. 60, print, i, and then let's, uh, let's put in a space and then a semicolon. So I'm doing i and then a space, so just the two quote marks with a spacing between it and then a semicolon to say I don't want to print out the new line when I'm done. And then 70, next. And then finally at the very end, we'll do one final print to get me to the, get me to the next line. So this is what my whole program looks like. Huh, interesting. Oh, because I'm printing out i, not a sub i. Whoops, 60, print a i. I was wondering, why is it just printing out the numbers in order? There we go. Now you see that little pause, right, when I run the program? Whoops, when I run the program, that little pause, that's how long it takes to fill up an array with uh, 100 random numbers. Oh, gosh, I was going to say something. Oh, the thing I was going to say was also in basic, you don't have any local variables. All variables are global. And you do have subroutines, but they're not named. So you can't say, like, call the, the calculate subroutine. There is no, there's no names you assign to them. You only have line numbers. So although you can call a subroutine, you would call it by its line number. You, you'd say, like, actually the command is go sub, uh, let's say line 100, and then it will go to line 100, it will execute those commands there, and then when it finds return, it'll go back to where it came from. But you don't have any local variables, which means your subroutines don't have parameters, they don't have variables, the values to return to you. When it encounters return, that just means go back to where you were. It doesn't mean return a value. And also, there's the, the call stack is only about 10 to 12 levels deep. You don't have very much memory on these computers, so you can't have a lot of nested subroutines. You only have about 10 or 12 deep that you can go, which makes recursion kind of difficult. You, so without local variables and with a very shallow call stack, recursion is very difficult to do. If there's time, Maybe I'll show you how you can do some recursion, but let's go ahead and do a bubble sort on this. Um, so I'm going to do bubble sort. Remember how bubble sort works? You have two loops. One loop is counting uh, the number of passes through the array, and the inner loop is looking at successive items in the array and swapping them if they're out of order. So we're going to write an outer loop. We're going to go for i 
equals 0 to 99. Actually, we've got to go 98. And then a loop inside of that for j equals 0 to 98. And then line 120 will say if a sub i is greater than a sub i plus 1, then we have to swap them. So we'll go t equals a sub i colon a sub i is equal to a sub i plus 1 colon and then a sub i plus 1 is equal to t. Okay, so there's our check uh, consecutive pairs of elements and then if they're out of order, swap them. And then 130, next. And 140, next. So this next here goes with this loop, and this next goes with this one. And then maybe around line 200, we'll basically print out it again. So we'll go for i equals 0 to 99. Print a sub i and a space, semicolon, colon, next. All right, here we go. Oh, you know what I'm also going to do is every time it does a pass through here, I'm going to print out what pass number we're on so we can see it at least making some progress. So maybe around 105, I'll say print pass uh, I. Okay, fill the array with random numbers. And here we are, pass zero, pass one, pass two, three, four, Five, six, seven. This is bubble sort, by the way, on 100 elements. You know, in, in a modern programming language, which you use on a, you know, in Java or C, sometimes they have a built-in sort function. You just call sort, and then it's almost instantly done. But here's bubble sort on 100 elements, and you can see it is not, not the fastest. We're not even halfway done yet. <laughs> oh, about two thirds done. We could actually make this a little faster. We can make it faster by shortening each pass. Every time you make one pass through the array, it moves the highest element up into the correct spot. And then the next pass will move the next highest element. So we don't actually need to pass all the way through the array each time. We can stop one less each time. And that'll actually make the whole thing run about twice as fast. Not a whole lot faster, but twice as fast. Almost done. Uh-oh. It doesn't appear to have worked. That's depressing. Huh. What happened there? Oh, I was supposed to use J. I was supposed to use J here, not I. Ugh, I gotta type in the lines again. 120. If A sub J. Then A sub J plus 1. Then T is equal to A sub J. A sub J is equal to A sub J plus 1. A sub J plus 1 is equal to T. And then let's, let's make that improvement here where 110, we're going to go for J equals 0 to uh, 98 minus I so that it shortens it every time. Okay, so there's our loop. Huh, 
It seems to be going slower at first, but hopefully it'll start speeding up as we get closer and closer to the end because the loops should be getting shorter and shorter as we go. I think it is speeding up. I, can, I think the passes are now coming a little bit faster. So why was it slower? Well, we, uh, I think there's more swapping to do for, for one thing. Previously, I was using I as the, um, as the, the thing to do the swapping. And so because it was using I, it was using the outer loop numbers instead of the inner loop numbers. And um, so once it had swapped the, the, the two positions into the right order, it just, it just didn't need to do any more swaps. Oh, there we go. Did you see it was speeding up towards the end? And now we've got everything in order. So that should have run about twice as fast as the previous one. Okay, so that's, that's bubble sort in basic. Um, let's see, what else can we do? Well, uh, how about this? Any suggestions from you? Other than, other than, uh, I know your suggestions are probably play games. <laughs> See what I was working on, and I think I mentioned that, mentioned this in, I don't remember if it was mentioned in this class or the other class, but I was working on writing a, a Wordle clone for the Apple II. And w one of the problems I had with, with writing Wordle was, well, how do I search a list of words and make sure that the word they typed in is actually a valid word? That's one of the things that the Wordle game has to do. Uh, you're trying to guess a five-letter word, and you only have six guesses to do it. You have to type in valid words every time. And um, there's about 2,000 words that it picks from as being the target word, and there's about... I think four to five thousand actual five-letter words to verify that your guess is a is a valid guess. And just searching through an array, well, you got you got multiple problems here. One is the memory of the computer is such that an array of two thousand five-letter words uses up about seventeen kilobytes of memory, and that's about half the available memory to store your program. And that doesn't, that doesn't, you know, give you any space to like do a user interface or, you know, to actually play the game. That's just strictly holding the array of words. And if you wanted to hold the array of valid words, uh, that's about four or 5,000 of them. That's just going to basically use up all of your available memory. So what do you do there? And um, my solution has been, well, I'm going to obviously sort the array. Uh, well, first of all, doing a linear search through 2,000 words was taking about, I think it was like 10, 10 seconds or so to just search for the word. And if, if the array was longer with 5,000 entries in it, it'd probably take about 30 seconds to search through that array, just to, just to verify whether your guess was even a valid guess or not. So obviously the thing to do is a binary search. So that meant sorting the words. Now, I, I could just bring the word list into my modern computer and tell it to sort it. It'd be done in a fraction of a second and load it back into the Apple. But my goal was to write everything in basic if I possibly could. So I set about writing a bubble sort for those 2,000 words. And I saw that it was going to take about, I think it was going to take on the order of maybe 12 hours to run just a sort on 2,000 words. So I said, that's ridiculous. I should actually use something like quick sort. But we don't have recursion. And on local variables, and quick sort is a recursive uh, cert for, cert, uh, recursive sort function. Um, so I had to write my own recursion engine. It's not that hard to do. 
what you need to set up is a stack with push and pop operations. So I set up a stack that was going to hold all of my local variables. I have to have a local variable to contain my pivot, my minimum, my maximum, and um, uh, what, and also a variable to keep track of how deep into the stack I am. So I set up all these separate uh, arrays to hold my local variables, and then I had a stack pointer. And every time I called the quick sort function, I would push, I would add one to the stack pointer, and every time I returned, I'd, I'd subtract one from the stack stack pointer. And um, of course, you can't call a subroutine. I only have a limit of about 10 to 12 subroutine calls, and sorting a list of uh, 2,000 words required a stack depth of about 30. So I don't even have a, uh, I can't even use GoSub to call my, my subroutine. So I had to use GoTo's and then have another stack that kept track of basically um, which line number I was on so that I could return back to the correct spot. Um, so I had to implement that all, all myself. And it worked. And the quick sort was able to sort that list of uh, 2,000 words in just a couple minutes. Just an amazing speed up at the expense of this huge program. <laughs> Once I had them sorted, I could write them to a disk file, and then the next step would be to implement some kind of binary search on that. And that's where I am right now, is uh, doing some kind of binary search on a, uh, a file that contains a bunch of alphabetized words. So if I wanted to output these numbers to a file, then I would do it like this. So after I've done sorting it and printing them out, let's do like 300. Okay, so where do I go from here? So there, there's actually in the basic here, there's no built-in disk operating system commands. Right. The basic that this computer is running is baked into the ROM of the computer. The computer knows how to do basic, but it does not know how to use the disk drive. The commands for using the disk drive, like opening a file and closing a file, those had to be added on later. But since the basic programming language is baked in silicon and it can't be changed, you had to figure out some way to do it. And so the way it works is you, you just print the um, DOS commands, like the open and the read and the write commands, but you prefix them with a special character that says uh, anything that's going to be printed from now on is a DOS command and not a basic command <laughs> and not going to the screen. So the special prefix character is ASCII value 4, which you can type by doing control D on your keyboard. So typically, the way you implement a DOS command, like to open a file, is to print that uh, ASCII value 4 and then your DOS command. And it looks like this, print character dollar sign 4. That tells it to print ASCII value 4, essentially to the screen, uh, followed by open, and this was called as nums. So that'll open the file, and then... We're going to write to the nums file. So you see open it, and then you say write, which is just setting the mode for the file. And now we'll just replicate what is in line 200. So 320 for i equals 0 to 99. Print a sub i. And let's do it one, one line at a time, one, one number per line. Next. And then uh, 3.30, oops, I, I can see right now that I have a problem, but I'll go back and fix that. Print character dollar sign four, close nums. Okay, here's my problem, is I didn't put print in front of these. Ah. Oh, the joys of programming in basic. This should have been 310. 
Okay, here's our program. So we're going to do we're going to generate random numbers, do a bubble sort on them, and then print them on the screen. And then we're going to open the nums file, write to it, tell it to write to it, and then anything I print from uh, that point forward is going to go to not to the screen but to the file. And then we're going to close the file. So let's run this program. Here's our random numbers. Now we're going to sort them. And again, this will take about a minute. I wasn't paying attention the first time I ran this. I assume it did speed up quite a bit towards the end. Oh yeah, I can see it going faster. Now, when it's done printing out the numbers on the screen, we should see this light light up. There we go, as it writes to the file. And the program is done. So here's our nums file right here. It occupies one block on the disk. Here's the current date. It doesn't have the current date. It thinks it's 1994 right now. Now, unfortunately, there is no way to just go view the file. You, uh, you got to write a program to do that. <laughs> so here's our existing program that uh, generates uh, 100 random numbers and then sorts them and then puts them on the, uh, the disk drive. So let's uh, clear this program out. Actually, let's save it first. We're going to go save um, and let's call this program uh, gen... Now, the, the dot in Apple Basic for file names doesn't mean anything. It's not like that's the extension. So it's uh, used kind of like um, a space, right? You, you couldn't have spaces in the file name, so a dot was used as a space. So here's my, here's my program right here. Generate numbers. It's a basic program and occupies one block. So let's go, let's go new. Now, program's gone. And let's write a program to read those, read those numbers in and print them on the screen. So let's go 10, uh, print, character, dollar sign, 4, open nums, 20, print, character, dollar sign, 4, read nums, 30, Um, oh, let's, let's do five dimension a with a hundred. Actually, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, I'm just going to print them on the screen as we go. So 30, we'll say input. A, so that, that reads a, a number off out of the file and puts it into a variable called A. And then 40 will print A on the screen. And then 50. Oh, we do need, we do need some kind of loop. So what we have to do here is we do need a loop. So we need to go uh, 30 for I equals 0 to 99. Uh, input A, print A, and then next. And 
40 print character dollar sign for close nums. And here they come. So there's a little bit in a nutshell about how to access files on an old Apple computer. So here's a little, some little tidbits about basic back in the day. It was a very limited programming language. So as I've mentioned before, variable names are all global. There's no local variables and they're limited to one or two characters. In, uh, names of the character, the names of the, the variables. And there were basically two types of variables. There were numeric variables and there were string variables. Oh, there's also array variables. So there's three types. There's, <laughs> there's numeric, string, and array variables. Um, numeric variables obviously are just like A or X or J. String variables have a dollar sign on the end of them. So A dollar sign is the string a, that can hold a string, obviously. And those are two separate variables. So you can have a variable called A that holds a number, and you can have a variable called A dollar sign that holds a string. And those are two separate variables. So already, you're not limited to like 26 variables. You've now got 52. Well, actually, you can use two character variable names, variable names also. So now you've got a few hundred that you can use. And then there's also um, uh, array variables. So like if I say dimension A, be a 100, now that, that is a third variable called A that can hold a hundred numbers. And that's different from A itself, which can hold one number. And then finally, you've also got a dollar sign 100. This gives us now a hundred strings. So, so essentially you can have four variables all called A, but that hold different things. Right. One holds numbers, a single number, one holds a single string, one holds uh, up to 100 numbers, and one holds up to 100 strings. Right. So there, there's that. Um, another thing is, every time you type in a statement, the computer quickly goes through your statement and tokenizes it. So it looks for the keywords, it looks for the commands that it already knows about, like for, next, um, print, uh, some of the built-in variables, you've seen like color, um, the, vari the, the keywords for changing the, the screen mode, graphics versus text. So it goes through your statement and it finds all those things and it quickly turns them into one byte codes. Okay, so it, it found like the word print here and it turned that into a one byte code that stands for the keyword print. This saves a little space. Instead of using five characters to store the word print, it just uses one byte to store the word print. And you probably also notice that sometimes the spacing on this is a little inconsistent, right? Sometimes there's no space following things. Sometimes there's one space. Sometimes there's two spaces. And uh, that's because when it prints out, when it lists out your program, anytime it finds one of those one byte codes, it has a lookup table, so it says, okay, I, I see code number 100 there. That means I'm gonna, that stands for, let's say, the keyword print. So it displays a space, and then that keyword, and then a space. So every keyword always has a space in front and a space behind. And what that means is that print here is a keyword, and so is chr dollar sign. So print had a space in front of it and a space behind it. CHR dollar sign also had a space in front of it and a space behind it. And so that's why you end up with two spaces here and only one space here. There's no way to get this parentheses nestled up against a dollar sign because that keyword is going to print out with a, um, a space around it. Um, but you have like no, no um, space here because anything else, anything that's not a keyword, just gets stored as is in your in the program listing. That means even things like numbers aren't converted to their binary values and stored in the program. They're just left as the ASCII values, actually the actual characters, 99 and 0. 
And this has an impact on your program. Um, because as it is interpreting your program, BASIC is an interpreted language, it, does not, it is not compiled. So as it is interpreting your, your program, when it runs across a number like this, it has to convert that into the numeric value. So it sees the 99 there. And what it does is that when it encounters the first nine, it stores that into a temporary spot to hold the numeric value. And then it moves to the next nine. And uh, what it has to do is take the number that it had stored, multiply that by 10 to make it 90, and then add on the next number that you see. Okay, so that's how it converts an ASCII character, set of characters into the numeric value. This is basically doing this base 10 conversion as it goes. So as this program is running and as this thing is looping, it is comparing I to 99 and it has to convert that number every single time through the loop. Right, so, so what that means is like, when you use bigger numbers, your program goes slower <laughs> because it has to convert the numbers every single time. So one of the tricks that basic programmers would use to make their programs go faster is don't put literal numbers in your program wherever possible. Store them in variables, right? So I would maybe put a variable at the top that goes like, um, let's say, M for max, or MA for max. Well, let's use MX for max equals 99, right? And then for line 30, I would say for I equals 0 to MX. And put a print a next. Right now, by storing 99 in a variable, variable lookups are faster than number conversion. <laughs> so, whenever possible, don't put literals in your program. Put them in variables. Right? This thing here, this character dollar sign four. Every time I print that out, it has to do a conversion. So maybe on line six, I'll say D dollar sign equals character, do character dollar sign four, like this, and then change line 10 to say print D dollar sign open nums, right? And that's gonna be faster than doing this conversion every single time. So this is a vastly different mindset from the current one, which is my C program or my Java program is compiled and so it doesn't really matter whether I do, whether I put small numbers or big numbers or put it in variables or not put it in variables because the compiler would take care of all that stuff for you. But here it's interpreted and interpreted in kind of like the most simple way possible. Numbers are converted on the fly as the program is writing into their numeric values. So it's faster to put them in variables. Um, the, uh, the next thing is these line numbers here are kind of critical. Obviously, they're used to order your statements. But if I was to type in line, uh, uh, first of all, the, the statements in my program are stored as a linked list. So if you're familiar with that data structure, it means that the, the statements are not actually stored in the order in which I type them in. They're stored kind of, actually, they're not stored in the order they appear in the program. They're stored more or less in the order I type them in and then pointers are rearranged to actually make it appear like it's in numeric order. So although I typed in lines five and six um, later, they appear earlier in the program, but I typed them in later, probably in memory, five and six are down here towards the bottom of the program, and then pointers are rearranged to make them appear like they're at the top of the program. So here's another little weird thing is, the, the next statement here, which is used to go to the next iteration of a loop, you can put after there a variable name. So I could say for I, uh, let's say X equals one to 10, uh, print X next, right? And that'll print the numbers one through 10. I could also say for X equals one to 10, print X next X. And it does the same thing. And sometimes you put the variable here because if you have, let's say, two nested loops, uh, you might actually want it to not go to the next iteration of the inner loop. You might want it to go to the next iteration of the outer loop, kind of abort the inner loop. 
And so you can put the variable name there to indicate which loop you want it to, to, to start over again. Um, but if you kind of like by habit always put the variable name there, it, it, makes your, it makes your program run slower because by putting the variable name there, it has to check. Is this actually a variable that's being used for a loop? Um, and if it's not, like if I say for x equals 1 to 10, print x, next y, right? Then it says, whoa, that's a variable that's not being used for a loop. So it has to check every time. Is this a variable that's being used for a loop? It's faster to not put in the variable name. <laughs> Just say next. And then it will go back and it, and it knows that it's in the inner loop and it, uh, or a loop called X. And so it just goes back up to the top of that loop and starts it over again. So is that freaky, right? You think, oh, it's good, pra good programming practice to always put the name of the variable there, but actually it makes your program run slower. Um, boy, I'm, I'm throwing a lot, of, a lot of details about the nitty gritty workings of BASIC. Here's another one. Uh, if your program contains a go-to, cause it to, to go to another line, then um, it doesn't actually know where that line is. It has to start scanning from the top of your program until it finds that line number. So if your program contains a lot of go-tos, it slows it down because every time you go to another line number, it has to start from the top of the program and scan down until it finds that line number and then starts executing from that point forward. So if you do want to put a lot of go-tos, you'll want to put those towards the front of the program, right? So that the go-tos don't have to scan as far. It's very tempting to put your subroutines at the end of the program and your kind of like your main towards the top of the program. But every time you call that subroutine, it has to start scanning from the top until it finds that line number and then it can start executing. And then when your subroutine is done, it encounters a return. It has to like scan from the top until it finds the line number to return to. So you kind of want to organize your program so all the subroutines are towards the front and the main part of the programs are toward the end. Normally, if you're just starting out programming in BASIC, you don't worry about these things. You don't think about it. You just start typing your statements and start using variables like you yeah, like you've been taught to. But if you want to eke out every last cycle of speed, this is what you have to do. You have to put your constants in variables. You have to put your subroutines up toward the front of the program. Um, you should avoid using variable names when you're using next. You should just, just say next. Uh, what else? Oh, um, just having more lines in your program is slower than putting multiple lines per statement, or multiple statements per line. Like right here, I've put in one, two, three, four statements on this line. And it's quicker to run a loop like this on one line than it would be to spread that loop across four lines. Because every time I did a next, it would have to go back and find, where does that loop start again? scan from the beginning of the program to find the start of that loop. But putting it all in one line means you could just run a tight little iter um, interpretation loop right on that line number there. Um, and then you also have to be, for larger programs, be constantly aware of how much memory your computer has. If you uh, write a program that's too big, it just starts overwriting like parts of the system memory. <laughs> if you make a variable an array that's too big, it just starts overwriting stuff. That happened to me when I was doing that Wordle word, pro, um, word uh, uh, sorting. Is um, I, I, I tried to sort a word list that was too long, and I ended up just like overwriting parts of the operating system, and so I ended up with garbage in my results. So that is a little bit of basic programming. You guys haven't said too much on, uh, on the chat. I guess you've just been watching. Do you have any questions?
Megatron says, 8-bit day is the best day. I wonder, can I hook up a, a gamepad to this emulator? Let me see if I can. I know I can to the app-based emulator, but I'm going to see if I can do it on this one. Let's try it. Games. I don't know if this is going to work. I hope it does. Just a standard. Standard controller. This was one of the best games at the time. <clears throat> it's going to seem quaint and simple by today's comparisons. Good, I can kick. Now, this is high resolution graphics, and by high resolution graphics, I mean it's about uh, 280 pixels across by I think it's 192 down. And one of the limitations at the time was if you increase the resolution, well, something's got to give. And uh, what gave was the number of colors. See if I remember how to run. There we go. No. Oop. So in high resolution mode, you've only got about seven colors, six or seven colors. And there's actually, I think, there's two whites and there's two blacks. So you really got a, you only got about six colors. Um, and so you can see the colors are basically blue, orange, uh, black, white. Um, I think there's like, there's like a green or something. And there's a purple. And like, that's it. So the, the colors, at least on the Apple, were quite limited. And the Commodore 64, like I said, had the benefit of being developed about three or four years later. So there was m more colors, higher resolution graphics. Now, I know there's a way to kick up and kick down, and I don't remember what it is. There we go.
And also there's a, a funny quirk of the colors in that the, the basically the pixels were arranged in odd and evil, even pixel numbers. So as you go across the screen, of course you start at pixel number zero, and then one and two and three and four and so forth. Um, um, <clears throat> but even though the, the resolution was like 280 by 192, effectively the horizontal resolution is only half that, 140. Because you had to use uh, pairs of pixels to make a color. So if you just colored, let's say, pixel 00, zero you, you had one set of colors you could use for that pixel. And then pixel 1, comma 0, the one right next to it, had a different set of colors. <clears throat> so it basically had two color palettes. And uh, what that meant was that <clears throat> you couldn't have two pixels um, of different colors next to each other, at least as far as odd and even, even pixel numbers go. <clears throat> so you couldn't have pixel number zero be orange and then the pixel number one be blue, right? Because um, when you join those together, you actually got white. So there were just some funny color, color artifacts. I'm trying to remember how to kick down. Oh, there we go. Um, just funny color artifacts. So if you put two color, two pixels of different colors together, I think it's different colors, then you get white, basically. And so that's why, if, if you remember when we were in graphics mode, and I was writing that program, you saw funny things like the text that was on the screen had like these weird color fringes on them. And that's because the text obviously is just, you know, one pixel wide, like the letter I is just one, one pixel wide. Um, but it had to put these color fringes on it. Because really, you know, like that letter I is occupying the spot occupied by, you know, blue pixels or orange pixels. Uh, basically in this game, you just like kick as fast as you can. That's just how you play it. And then I can also punch, right? But punching, I can't punch like as far. Oh, got him. Another guy. So you have to make your way towards that gate. Anyway, I'm, I've had enough of this. Let's see, let's load another game in there. What else do we have here? Mm, let's do this one. See, there's that like, color, weird color fringing I'm talking about. You can also see that, see the colors in the, up here, right? That's what I'm talking about. So what are we trying to do in this game? Obviously just shoot at things. Try not to bump into the walls, which are just mysteriously like in the middle of nowhere. Why is there a brick wall on a battlefield? One must not question these things. Okay, 
that's enough of that game. Choplifter, another groundbreaking game of the time. Oops. Is it going? Actually, I don't think it's going. There we go. Your mission, rescue hostages. Okie dokie. And try not to get shot by, oh, I tried to crash and try not to get shot by the tanks. All right, so if I'm in this mode here, I can, I can bomb. So if I'm like face toward the camera, I can, I can bomb and if I'm, sideways then I can shoot then you land and people come into your helicopter Then go back over here, you land. And then, woo, I've got four points. <laughs> the only points you're awarded are for the, ah, uh, I got shot with the airplane. The only points you're awarded are for the, um, the hostages you rescue. Okay, let's get out of here. Oh, I got shot down when I had seven hostages in my helicopter. So, 11 people died, four rescued. That's not so great. One of my favorite games was Droll, and I don't see that on here. Oh well. Uh, graphics. We got Pascal on here. I could, I could have shown you some Pascal, but I didn't get around to that. Anyway, so that's it for 8-Bit uh, for Day. I'm hoping maybe this summer I'll do more with that Wordle game that I was working on and show you more about how to do things like quick sort, binary search. Um, I might end up building hash tables. I'm thinking that the binary search is still going to be too slow. So I'm thinking about doing hash tables and uh, how we do all that in BASIC, which is very limiting. Remember, 
uh, just global variables, no real subroutines, and um, how do we make a Wordle game, a text-based Wordle game? Well, I hope you enjoyed watching uh, some of the demos today. Uh, see, on Wednesday, we'll be back, and um, I don't know, I've got something else for you. We'll figure out something else. And then uh, if you're watching my Tuesday and Thursday class, then uh, we are doing, uh, we're going to finish network, network programming. And I think we're also going to end up doing a quantum computer simulator. Remember, we did quantum computing in this class last Wednesday. So we're going to write a C program in my C programming class to simulate a quantum computer and actually have it do the calculations rather than doing them all kind of like um, on paper like we did. So that'll come up on uh, probably tomorrow. So if there aren't any questions, then I'll let you go for today. And I will see you next time. Hope you all have a great day. Take care. Be safe. Stay warm. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. And uh, for the people on YouTube, I think we'll take off. Again, I'm, I'm not feeling that well today, so I'm going to go and do a little resting. Have a great day, everyone. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.